In our last, our introductory session, we were introduced to the problem on Paul and the law, and that is namely the different and seemingly contradictory nature of Paul's statements on the law. Now we're thankfully not the first people to have thought of this problem and to think of uh, some answers to it. And the readings that you have introduce you to a number of the proposed uh, solutions. In this section, I want to skim over uh, a variety of solutions, uh, ones that you have read about, and I want to skim over them because uh, almost all of them have not been widely embraced. And I want to, in this session, highlight the Reformed answer to this. Not that the Reformed position is free from any questions or problems, but most of us uh, studying here at Calvin Seminary are envisioning ministry in a Reformed church, the Christian Reformed denomination, or some other Reformed uh, church or a denomination. And it's important then for us to be aware of the tradition uh, from which we come and in which we are likely to serve. So uh, the solutions that we're going to skip over, the first one can be called the interpolation approach. You didn't read about that because it is by far um, the least uh, uh, convincing of the different approaches. But you can go through the PowerPoint notes to hear about that. The second one, which also hasn't been widely embraced, but you did read about, is the contradictory approach. And this has been associated with that Scandinavian scholar, in particular, Heike Reisinen. It's an older view that goes well back before him, but in recent times, he, he well, as I put it, he, he, um, he did a really, really good job developing a really, really bad thesis. And the thesis was, is that we can't solve the problem, of Paul and the law because Paul was inherently confused or contradictory. And that may sound shocking to you, and uh, that may well be, but he did a very, very good job in presenting his case. And a lot of scholars within the academy were convinced that his explanation was indeed a plausible one. Now, that view has been overshadowed by the rise of the so-called new perspective on Paul, which we'll get to in uh, subsequent presentations, but the contradictory approach has been one that's been advocated and is, uh, is out there. Another approach can be called the developmental approach, and this is the idea that Paul's ideas changed or developed over time. Most closely associated with uh, two scholars, Hans Hubner and John Drain, and you also read about those approaches in uh, the reading for this session. But it too hasn't been widely adopted, and so we move on then to um, a series of answers that generally can be called the harmonizational approach. First of all, what we mean by this term before we then focus in on the Reformed faith. Harmonizational in the sense that this position begins with the assumption that Paul did have a coherent view on the law. The other approaches all take quite seriously that Paul's views are differing and or changed. Right? But these approaches instead start off with the presupposition that Paul had a unified view of the law, and then you have one of two choices. You can either uh, take the Lutheran approach, and then usually what you do is you say Paul's fundamental position on Paul and the law is a negative one, right? We've died to the law, we've been set free from the law, and then you have some challenge and responsibility to explain the away then the positive statements. And the Reformed faith, of which we are a part, right, takes the opposite position. They say that Paul has a fundamentally positive view toward the law, and then the challenge for us is to explain why he makes then some negative statements. And so let's look then at the Reformed faith, and you can see that there are a bunch of distinctions that uh, different people have made, a distinction between law and legalism, but now I want to go to distinction number two, and that is the classic reform view of distinguishing different types of laws. Before I go there, just as a foreshadowing of what we'll get in subsequent presentations, you can see that in the next presentation, a separate video, we'll, we'll look at E.P. Sanders, who makes a distinction between getting in and staying in, and if those terms don't make much sense to you, they will after we work through that material. And then finally we have the distinction between the law as normative revelation as opposed to the law as national boundary markers. You probably know that approach uh, instead by its more popular name, uh, the New Perspective. 
So right now we're going to go to distinction number two and, uh, and highlight what the Reformed faith has uh, said on this matter. Now let me uh, emphasize something that often is confused by students. We're going to see that the Reformed faith distinguishes between three different types of law. But somewhere down the road, we'll also perhaps read or hear about how the Reformed faith talks about three different functions of the law. And so you've got three types and three functions. And I just know from experience that three and three, sometimes students confuse the two. And so let me stress again that we're talking now about the different types of law, not the different functions that the law may have. Now, uh, this view is uh, articulated most clearly in Calvin and in the confessions that emerged out of the Reformation, but it has a pedigree that goes back much older than that, and so that's why it's important for you to see that it goes back to Origen and others associated with the school at Alexandria, and of course it's still advocated by many Reformed theologians uh, today. So what are the three different types of law? So instead of treating the law all as the same thing, as one big blob called the law, Reformed people say, no, it's important to distinguish three different types of law. One type, they would argue, is called the ceremonial law or the cultic law. These are laws pertaining to the sacrificial system of uh, Judaism that we meet in the Old Testament. Secondly, they would distinguish what can be called the civil law, or sometimes also called the juridical law. And these are laws pertaining to order and justice within the people of God, Israel, as a nation, especially within a particular period of time within redemptive history. And then the third type is usually called the moral or sometimes called the ethical law. And these are laws pertaining to our relationship both to God and to our neighbor. Now it's important not just to know about the names or the types, the three different types that uh, are part of this uh, threefold or tripartite distinction, but to know how uh, Reformed people view them from a redemptive historical perspective. So. The ceremonial law, they would argue, is fulfilled in Christ. Christ is the once and for all sacrifice, so there's no need to repeat the sacrifices because Christ's death was sufficient, not only, well, for, for, for all the sins of humankind. Now, that doesn't mean that the laws pertaining to the sacrificial system are forgotten or ignored. No, uh, we would see that beneath them or lying underneath these, um, these particular ceremonial or cultic laws are principles of piety or holiness that uh, are still normative today. So the principle, the deeper underlying truth claim of holiness or piety that God's people are, expo are, are expected to demonstrate in their life, that principle is still carried on today, but the specific manifestation of that by means of a cultic system outlined in the Old Testament, the specific manifestation of those laws are not. What then about the civil or the juridical laws? Well, these laws, too, have to be viewed within redemptive history. In other words, these laws played a particular role in a particular time in redemptive history. But in light of the coming of Christ, now there is a different role that the nation of Israel or the people of God play. So in the New Covenant, we don't need these laws, specific laws for pertaining, you know, what happens if I'm over at my neighbor and... Um, I don't know, he's got a faulty fence around his flat roof and uh, I fall off and injure myself. What are his responsibilities? Or, or what if I accidentally uh, harm, you know, uh, a fellow Jew's cow or oxen? What are my responsibilities? Or what are the penalties, you know, for, for not living uh, according to God's will? These, are, uh, these had a particular role within redemptive history. But that role has been changed significantly in light of the coming of Christ. And that doesn't mean that these civil or juridical laws are no longer uh, applicable today. In other words, that we ignore them completely. We may not follow the manifestation, the specific 
external application of these rules, but they do betray or they do reveal a deeper uh, principle of especially justice or equity that the people of God should manifest uh, today. You can see here I have a brief note about theonomist or Christian reconstructionist. I don't know how familiar you are with those terms. This is a small subsect within some reform circles that argue differently about these civil or juridical laws and would want some of these laws still to be in force for today. But that's an extremely minor position and so um, we, we move on. And the third then is the moral law. And this too has been fulfilled in a powerful way in Christ. Christ is the only one who perfectly fulfilled all the demands of God's holy law. He's the only one who could live a sinless and perfect life. But just because that law has been fulfilled in Christ doesn't mean that, that, that those laws pertaining to holiness with regard to God and our neighbor are no longer normative for the church today. So the, the people of God today still should follow these holy laws not as a way to secure our salvation, but as a response to God's gracious activity in Christ. I'm going to take time uh, in this presentation to read these quotes. You can do that. You can just pause uh, this video and read in depth if you would like. But I did want you to see that this tripartite distinction is indeed found in Calvin and in the Reformed Confessions. So you can see in this paragraph I've highlighted the word the moral law. And so when Calvin adds the word or the adjective moral before the law, you can see he's not treating the law as a whole, as one and the same thing. He's making distinctions between different types of law. And one of the types that he's talking about in this paragraph is entitled the moral law. And here's another paragraph that deals with a different type of law, the so-called ceremonial law. And the next paragraph with yet a third type, the judicial or, ju or juridical laws. And then you see some comments about how he views the ongoing role of these laws, not only their fulfillment in Christ, but their ongoing role by the people of God today. The Westminster Confession is not a confession of the Christian Reformed Church, but it's a widely used uh, confession of Reformed Christians around the world, and it too operates with this tripartite distinction between types of law. You can see after it introduces the law in paragraph 2, in paragraph 3 it says, besides this law, which I just talked about in the preceding paragraph, the confession says, commonly called moral, now he talks about, the confession that is, talks about ceremonial laws as a second type. And then in the next paragraph you have yet the third type and that's the judicial laws. And then the fifth paragraph talks about the ongoing continuing uh, nature of the moral law in a way that is unique compared to the other two. And so you can see in the Westminster Confession it very much operates with this tripartite understanding of three different types of law. It's less clear in the Belgic Confession, but you can see how Article 25 of the Belgic Confession also operates uh, to some degree with this distinction. It doesn't teach it, but it presupposes it in its comments about the ceremonials, the ceremonies and symbols of the law, right? Especially there referring to the uh, ceremonial aspects of the cultic system of Israel. Now how shall we evaluate um, the Reformed uh, answer to this? Um, by the way, maybe I should just backtrack and say what Reformed people would say is, okay, when Paul speaks positively about the law, right, he's speaking about the ongoing continuing nature of that law's role in the Christian's life, but when he speaks negatively, he's either speaking about especially the ceremonial or the juridical laws, or maybe even different than that, not so much the laws themselves, but the wrong use of those laws. So it isn't so critical of the law as it is the wrong use of the law. So for instance, circumcision. So if some would try to misuse the Old Testament laws pertaining to circumcision, it's not so much that Paul's against the law as he is the wrong use of that law to elevate circumcision to a matter of theological necessity requirement 
And, and we have a ha handy name for that that the original Greek doesn't, right? We call that either legalism or works righteousness. But Paul then has a coherent view of the law, and this explains why he speaks sometimes positively and sometimes negatively. It depends on what type of law Paul is referring to and also the use of those laws by the earliest Christians. So now then, what about evaluating uh, this Reformed distinction? Now there is an, a weakness that we ought to concede right off the bat, because otherwise others will. And that is, uh, this threefold distinction is not taught anywhere in Scripture explicitly. In other words, you know, you can't turn to Ephesians 7 verse 6. I hope you understand why I referred to Ephesians 7, right? But you can't go to Ephesians 7 verse 6 or some other passage and Paul will say, you know, there are three kinds of laws. The first type is called ceremonial and the second is called judicial and the third is moral and then goes on to explain not only what those names mean but also how we should view them in light of the coming of Christ. So, so that's a weakness, I guess, of this view. Although we should also point out that I don't think it necessarily delivers a death blow to the reform view. There are actually other important teachings or doctrines of Scripture that are not taught explicitly, but are what? Are deduced from Scripture. The best example of that, I think, is the Trinity. So when my Jehovah Witnesses come over to my uh, to my house, and and uh, and they often do, before they can tell me, you know, this fact, I think it's better. I usually say to them, I'll say, although the Bible nowhere refers to the word Trinity, nevertheless, there are lots of passages in which God reveals Himself as three persons, and then I draw their attention to those texts that support that kind of idea. And so, there's nothing wrong with the idea of a teaching that isn't explicitly taught, but rather is deduced from Scripture. And that seems to be the case when we look at Scripture as a whole, and especially Paul's letters. So, for example, let's look at 1 Corinthians 7.19. Right? At first blush, this sounds like a, well, it sounds like almost a silly statement for Paul to say, right? Circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing but the keeping of the commandments of God. Now, I don't know about you, but the reason it seems silly is because if you look at it carefully, you know, keeping the commandments of God, God commanded the Israelites to be circumcised. So how can you say, Paul, that circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing but keeping the commandments of God? So one way to look at this verse is to say that Paul is mixed up. He's contradictory. He doesn't make sense. However, the statement could be logically uh, plausible. It, it, does, it could make perfect sense if in Paul's mind circumcision deals with one type of law right? that is different than maybe other types of law. Circumcision deals with what we would call in the Reformed tripartite distinction as a ceremonial law. And, and even here Paul is not so much talking about the law as the wrong use of the law. That is, Jewish Christians who are pushing the issue of circumcision. And in that context, Paul speaks negatively about circumcision. He says, circumcision is really nothing, and actually uncircumcision really is nothing. Right? Uh, properly understood, uh, those things, uh, as long as you don't elevate them to a theological requirement, a necessity for salvation, right? Something you have to do in order to be fully the members of God, right? Then neither one is really that important. And that's why Paul can have Timothy circumcised, right, for practical, pragmatic reasons. And then he instead stresses the commandments of God. And when he refers to the commandments of God, he's not referring to the whole law. He's referring to, I guess, not only the moral law in particular, but the other ongoing way in which the ceremonial and the civil laws, those principles, would have an uh, ongoing effect in uh, believers' lives uh, today. Here's another example, I think, where the distinction uh, helps you make sense of what Paul says. So in the first part of Ephesians, chapter 2, Paul says something like this. He talks about abolishing in his flesh, that is Christ's flesh, the law with its commandments and regulations. So now that sounds pretty negative, right? Paul talks about the law somehow being abolished, right? Gotten rid of. But then later in the letter, 6 verse 2, he quotes from the Ten Commandments. He says, positively, when he quotes it, he says, honor your father and your mother. So at first blush, you might say, wait a minute, these are contradictory. In the first part of the letter, Paul says something negative about the law. In the last part of the letter, he says something positive. He's mixed up. He's confused. 
However, maybe uh, when we look at these statements, we ought to keep in mind the different types of law. So let's look at chapter 2 a little more closely. So the context of chapter 2 is that the Ephesian church is divided, and they're divided apparently over the issue of circumcision. So the Jewish wing of the Ephesian church, or the churches in Ephesus and the surrounding area of Asia Minor, the Jewish Christians are saying, you've got to be circumcised, you've got to be circumcised, you've got to be circumcised. And the Gentile Christians in these churches and region are saying, you've got to be kidding, you've got to be kidding, you've got to be kidding. And so there was a tension between the two, a tension so great that there was division. And so Paul enters into that discussion and he talks about Christ who takes the two, and by two he means the Jew, Jewish believer and the Gentile believer, and he makes them one. And how did he do that? Well, Paul says here that he, he, he destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. We could talk about what that means. But for now, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. So when Paul talks about abolishing the law with its commandments and regulations, I suggest you he wasn't thinking about the whole law in toto. No, he was thinking of a more specific type of law, namely those types of laws that deal with circumcision, the issue that was dividing the Ephesian Christians and churches in this area. Now we happen to have a name for those kind of laws. We put circumcision under those laws dealing with Israel's cultic or sacrificial system. And we can see that in Christ, right, those laws have in a certain sense been abolished, right? Even though, again, the principle of piety underlying them is still, ha still an ongoing uh, uh, obligation for the church today. But that would allow Paul to say what he says in chapter 2, at the same time then in chapter 6, speak very positively about another part of the law. Right? Now we happen to have a, a, a name for uh, the Ten Commandments. Right? We see that as part of the moral or ethical law. And even though Paul maybe didn't have different names for these categories, you could see that if he operated with these distinctions, so if he had some sense that the law wasn't all one thing, but it had different parts or types, then you could make sense and you could plausibly see why Paul says what he says in a letter like Ephesians. This distinction also, I think, explains why we have, on the one hand, negative statements about the law and positive statements about the law. Here's a slide that we saw in the introduction to the problem. Remember the slides on the left, right? Those are the strong statements that somehow we've been died to the law, we've been set free from the law. And the other side has to do with the ongoing role that the law plays in believers' life. And so the negative statements, again, may not be a negative of the law per se, but it may be a negative use of the law. Especially those kinds of laws uh, where um, you highlighted the Jewish identity, right? Laws pertaining to circumcision and food restrictions and, and things like that, right? That they were elevated to a theological requirement and Paul speaks pretty strongly about how we've been set free or we've died from those kind of obligations. But that doesn't mean that anything goes, right? There still is, especially for the moral law, right? How we live in a right relationship to God and our neighbor, there's still a role that the law plays in Christians' life. Not as a requirement for salvation, of course, but as a response, as a grateful, obedient response for what God has done for us in Christ. Now, in the next few slides, what I attempted to do, although rather briefly, is to show that maybe Paul wasn't the only one who operated with this distinction of types of law. In other words, maybe Jesus or other Jews of that time period didn't treat the law as one whole blob, right, the same stuff, but also made distinctions between three different types. And now, I don't need to prove this in order for you to be convinced that Paul does it, right, because maybe, uh, maybe this was a truth just revealed to Paul directly, or maybe this was something unique to Paul, right, uh, through the working of the Spirit in his life. But if I can show that other Jews of that day similarly treated the law that way, well then I guess that might strengthen the plausibility that Paul might be doing the very thing that we've proposed he's doing in our text. So for example, I have one text here from Jesus. Right? Jesus has some harsh words for the scribes and Pharisees of that day. And he accuses them of what? Of neglecting the weightier matters of the law. Now there's not a lot here, but 
The fact that Jesus refers to the weightier parts of the law suggests that maybe Jesus didn't have the law all as the same thing, all equal, right, without any kind of distinction or differentiation. Here instead it seems to suggest that there are weightier parts and then the unspoken other half is there are less weighty parts. And the scribes and the Pharisees have focused wrongly on the less weighty parts and Jesus criticizes them for it. So that's at least a hint that maybe Jesus too didn't treat the law as all the same thing but operated maybe not with the names that we did but again made distinctions uh, between different types of law. Um, another uh, uh, further evidence uh, has to do with extra biblical evidence. So these are writings um, that we discover uh, from between the ending of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New. We often refer to this period as the inter testamentary period, right? The time between the two testaments. Um, in more politically correct terms, uh, sometimes it's referred to as Second Temple Judaism. So this is Judaism during the existence of the Second Temple, right? Uh, the temple that was rebuilt after the Temple of Solomon was uh, destroyed. And we have a window into the way many Jews thought in these texts. And so Frank Thielman is uh, one scholar, for example, who cites many of these texts in which it's not stated explicitly, but the Jews reflected in these texts seem to have operated with this distinction of different types. So, for instance, um, this text of, from the letter to Aristius. Uh, this is actually a document that deals with how the Septuagint came to be, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Anyway, in that story, we read about a high priest, Eliezer, right? And he tries to explain to people of that day passages, quote, in the law dealing with food and drink and animals regarded as unclean. And Eliezer seems a little bit embarrassed as he dances around these laws. And, and remember, we, we would call these laws ceremonial laws. And Eliezer tries to re-explain them, right, in terms of more moral virtues. So it seems to suggest that this high priest, this Jewish high priest, didn't treat all the law the same, but was trying to, what we call the ceremonial law, explain it in a way that a Gentile audience of that time would not only understand, but find uh, applicable for their life. Pseudophoclides is another document, and it talks at great length about what we would call the moral parts of the law. And it's interesting that even though he goes on and on about the law and how wonderful and great it is and its ongoing role in people's lives today, he never says anything about circumcision or food laws or Sabbath observance or uh, holy days. And so the question is, now why did he do that? Is it because this writer too, this Jewish writer, also didn't treat the law all the same, but took those laws, which we conveniently subsume under the heading ceremonial, and treated them as being somewhat different or unique? The Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs is yet a third document. Um, this is a, a kind of... Um, a form of writing in which a great patriarch is on his deathbed and he calls all his family around. It's like last words of wisdom or advice. Typically the patriarch will say, these are the bad things I did, don't do them, don't repeat and make the same mistakes I did, and these are the positive things that I did, make sure that you do that. And it's interesting, for instance, in the Testament of Issachar, right? When he talks about um, the upright life that he wants his family members and uh, succeeding generations to follow and emulate, notice the kind of things that he mentions, right? He talks about how they should be faithful, right? You should be faithful to your wife and not have sex with others, right? He says you should avoid drunkenness and you should be uh, truthful. You shouldn't have deceit and you shouldn't covet others and you should demonstrate generosity to the poor and so forth. But it's striking that nowhere in there does he say things like make sure that you circumcise your children and your grandchildren and make sure that you perform the sacrifices that are required or make sure that you observe uh, the distinctions between clean and unclean food. So the question arises, is that because here we have another example of a Jew who didn't treat the law as all the same thing, but made distinctions between different types, and not only different types, but also their ongoing role uh, as well. And I'll skip over the story of Josephus. Uh, well, maybe I shouldn't because it is interesting because uh, here you have a king, so you have a Gentile who's converted to Judaism, 
Uh, but of course he hesitated, and, and you might to be sympathetic, uh, he hesitated with being circumcised. And it's striking that this Jewish merchant now says instead of, well, he doesn't say, oh, you can't be a true Jew unless you're circumcised. Instead says, quote, right, that, um, that quote, he could worship God even without being circumcised, if indeed he had fully decided to be a devoted adherent to Judaism, for it was this that counted more than circumcision. That's a striking story. So for this Jewish merchant, all right, you could see that circumcision didn't have quite the same weight uh, in terms of a commandment, a law, than other commandments did. And in fact, he says you could still worship God even though you didn't. Now, um, all of these texts suggest that Paul, too, didn't treat the law all as the same substance, but he operated with, even though he may not have had names, convenient terms like we did, but he had different types of law in mind. And this explains how Paul, in many occasions, can speak positively about the law, and yet in other occasions to speak negatively. Well, friends, um, this has been then a summary, an introduction to how the reform faith has wrestled with and tried to solve the problem of Paul and the law. But things took a, a major turn with the paradigm changing work of E.P. Sanders. And this started or ushered in the so-called new perspective, not only on Paul, but on Judaism. And it's to that subject we turn next. See you in a minute.